this point, you may or may not be aware of the fact that the ACI is structured, so the application centric infrastructure is actually st structured around the idea of multi tiered applications. So we find ourselves looking at tying together application functionality in a multi tier design. Now, what that normally implies, the way Cisco likes to do this is we will create, say for instance, a series of web servers. Those series of web servers will afford connectivity to a series of application servers. And then obviously those application servers are then going to be tied to some type of a database or database cluster. We refer to this as a three-tier application design. Now, the ACI, I mean, ACI stands for Application Centric Infrastructure. So the, the goal here is to design a networking environment that's going to lend itself to multi tier application functionality. So if we were to take a look at the fact, let's say that I have dub dub server one and I have dub, actually, you know what, let me do it this way. So what I'll do is I will represent each of these functions with a different color. So we'll use red and then we'll use yellow. So what I may find myself doing in its most simplest form is I'll normally end up creating some type of three tier application like we see here and ultimately the thing that we need to recognize is, is that these servers these little circles that I'm drawing are going to be assigned to an object that I can then in turn use to manage these devices. We refer to these devices as end points. So in this scenario I have one, two, three end points. However, what I would ordinarily do is I would take these endpoints and I need to associate these endpoints to a logical construct that I build inside of the ACI infrastructure and that is referred to as an end point group. So what I would do is I would create say for instance EPG1 I would create EPG2 I would create EPG three and these devices I mean obviously it would be it could be also EPG web EPG app and EPG database if I wanted to be able to have a more human readable variation here but what I end up doing at the end of this scenario is, is I'm going to be creating these endpoint groups which at the end of the day are just going to be a collection of similar endpoints that are providing services. And then what I can do is I could, as an example here, let's say that I have three of these. So I'll go over here and look at the orange, actually that's the red pin. Look at the orange pin here. Let's say I have three of these devices. Well, what I do is I tie all three of these devices to the same end point group and then what I do is based on the fact that these guys are part of the same endpoint group is, is I apply my APIC defined policies to these endpoint groups. Now that policy that I apply to the endpoint group is going to not only govern say for instance behaviors, it could also govern the actual a type of endpoint it can govern and will govern the interfaces that I'm going to be running or I can actually dictate what type of external domain 
I'm going to connect to. And we have many of these. I have layer 2 bridged. So I have external bridge domains. So I'll just put in the layer 2 for the functionality. I have external routed domains that I can connect to, i.e. layer 3 connectivity. So in this, in this instance, I'm connecting to, say, for instance, switches via trunks. So this would be a trunk connection. I could be connecting to, say, for instance, a layer 3, layer 4, well, I'm sorry, layer 2, layer 3 capable switch. So for instance, I'd be c connecting to some device that's providing some type of router functionality. So as an example, I could be running a routing protocol, say, for instance, OSPF or BGP or some other protocol. And what ends up happening is, is I also have the capability of being able to connect to bare metal connections. So this could be, say, for instance, a bare metal server. I also have the capability of being able to connect to hypervisors for the purposes of being able to configure and work with and control virtual distributed switches inside of those devices via what we refer to as a VMM domain, a virtual machine manager domain, where that virtual machine manager may be something like in our lab, vCenter as an example. So it's important to keep in mind, like I said, that an endpoint group is going to be a collection of similar endpoints that are typically going to be servicing an application tier. So keep in mind, these are my application tiers, the www tier, the app tier, and the db tier that's functioning in this idea of a three-tier application design. It's also important to keep in mind that the endpoints are also going to require similar policies. Keep in mind that they're going to exist. So when I create an endpoint group, remember, these constructs that I'm creating here actually reside inside of the policy section of my tenant. So if I drew my tenant over here, remember we had the configuration. So again, we'll just say tenant. And for the sake of conversation, I'll just use TN Terry again. And that's the box. And inside of that box, remember, it's subdivided into two sections. The first is the network section. The second is the policy section. So inside of the network section, we know that I actually create VRFs. Inside of the VRFs, I create bridge domains. Inside of those bridge domains, I create subnets. So again, it's just a series of cascading containers that I use inside of the network portion of the tenant. Now, it's also just as important to note that on the right side, remember, we're going to be defining policy through the configuration of, in fact, we'll just go ahead and I'll put the AP, the application profile. The application profile is going to be where I create, so we'll just say AP here, and inside of the AP, I'm going to create my endpoints. So let's just say endpoint group one. I could have endpoint group two. So I have two endpoint groups that are part of this configuration. But remember, these endpoint groups require functionality because I need to be able to forward information for these endpoint groups and between these endpoint groups inside the same tenant. So when we start doing the configuration, what we have to do is we are going to actually assign the endpoint group to a bridge domain. So this is the linkage. This is how I link the logical stuff inside of the application profile, i.e. the endpoint groups. This is the way that I link the EPGs to an abstracted forwarding service. And that abstracted forwarding service is going to be the layer 2 forwarding service known as a bridge domain. 
Now, it's important to also understand that if I create an EPG, so let's say EPG dub dub dub. So I'm emulating this configuration right here where I have these four devices. And these four endpoints are actually going to be connected to the same EPG. It's important to understand that right now all of these devices can communicate. So they have what is referred to as unrestricted intra EPG communication. That means that host 1, host 2, and host 3 will be able to communicate with each other perfectly fine unless I decide to actually create what is referred to as a micro-segmented EPG. Now, if I were to do that, what that would be is it would basically take this EPG and make it almost the similar construct to, say, an isolated VLAN and a private VLAN in Nexus, which means these devices would not be able to talk to one another. And in order to allow them to talk to one another, I would have to go ahead and apply contracts. Now, we haven't talked about contracts yet. Contracts exist to allow me to dictate the policy that's going to run between EPGs. So if I wanted app and DB to be able to communicate with one another, I'd have to make a contract that allows this. Because remember, inside the VACI, I have a zero trust element until I go ahead and I assign devices to the same endpoint group. Once I put them inside the same endpoint group, it's almost like assigning, say, for instance, a permit any IP access list between these devices. Just understand that intra traffic or intra EPG traffic is permitted by default. Inter EPG traffic, so it's going to be communication between endpoint groups inside the same tenant, require a contract. In fact, communication between EPGs in different tenants as we've already said, will require the creation of a contract. Now, when it comes to these endpoint groups, so when it comes to these constructs, constructs right here, these could be anything from virtual servers. They could be bare metal servers. They could be old school mainframes. They could be IP storage devices. They can be switches and routers. They can even be layer four through layer seven service nodes. Now, that's really, really important because what ends up happening in this scenario, I may find myself wanting to make certain that each of these three devices that are going to be part of endpoint group one are going to be providing dub, dub, dub services. So what I may want to do is I actually may want them to put them behind a load balancer that's going to provide me some type of ISLB functionality with regard to accessing these resources via rotating on the basis of TCP ports. So just keeping in mind that I have the capability of being able to bake this functionality in whenever I do my builds and I have actually the capability of being able to physically insert these devices through something called service graphs. A service graph allows me to be able to put in either a logical load balancer or a physical load balancer. I can actually use a service graph to deploy traffic between, say, for instance, a virtual firewall or a physical firewall. It doesn't even have to be a Cisco firewall. It could be a virtual Palo Alto firewall if that's what we want to implement. However, in this particular session, we are going to be looking at the physical world. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be defining a physical infrastructure that we're going to be connecting to. And that physical infrastructure is going to be between chassis one, ACI lab, and chassis two, ACI lab. These together are going to be where we're going to start looking at how we're going to actually apply these configurations, thus allowing me to be able to communicate from the pod allotted interface here. So in, in instance, in my lab, this is going to be Ethernet 3.5 for pod 1. And I'm going to be configuring it such that I can communicate to Ethernet 
on chassis two. And we're going to make all of this take place and function through the creation of EPGs. But what I'm going to do first is I'm just going to create the EPGs because before we actually deploy EPGs and, and do the physical assignment, I want to spend some time on the blackboard talking about domains. But I figured the best place to illustrate what we just talked about now is going to be by turning our attention to the graphical user interface in the APIC itself. So I'll see you guys in that presentation. And until then, I'm Terry Vinson, and I'd like to thank you for learning Data Center with me.